In this module, we will be looking at sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia. This is the third out of five sinus arrhythmias we are covering in this course. Now, a sinus bradycardia was a little too slow, less than 60 beats per minute, kind of like us maybe on a Monday morning. Well, sinus tachycardia is the opposite. We're looking at heart rates greater than 100, in which we can still see those characteristic patterns on our ECG tracing. That includes the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. Now, sinus tachycardia typically is a heart rate between 100 and 150 beats per minute, and there are a lot of things that can create those changes. For example, maybe you have a fever, you've been ill, and your temperature is high. Well, our body is supporting our, our needs for oxygen and nutrition by creating a higher heart rate. Maybe you've been anxious, you just wrote a big exam, or you've got this, you're meeting the in-laws and you've never met them before, and you have a little bit of anxiety. There could be illnesses. Maybe you've just run, gone for a run and your exercise is only a temporary elevation of that heart rate. All of these things need to be treated very uniquely. Other common things would be the use of caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. And then of course, medications can also have side effects. Our general rule of thumb though is that a sinus tachy is between 100 and 150. Once it gets to be above 150, we start to look for cardiac pathology. But that doesn't mean that cardiac pathology doesn't fit in here as well. So let's take a look at some of the cardiac causes that can cause sinus tachy. We can have a uh, shock. When our body is low in volume, our heart rate increases to try to match that cardiac output. Remember, stroke volume times by heart rate. Inflammation around the heart itself, so that's that pericarditis, that pericardial sac, and heart failure. These are all ways in which our body is not able to fully function and get the nutrients and oxygen that it needs. So our heart is trying to compensate. Then we have other compensatory issues such as maybe we have anemia. And if we don't have enough red blood cells transporting hemoglobin, which transports oxygen, then our body will throw up the red flag. I need more oxygen and our heart rate will increase. Pulmonary embolism, we will definitely see an increase in heart rate, an acute change for sure, and it happens quickly. Uh, sepsis, if we have an infection, our heart is working to, to circulate all those good things that we need to help clear up the infection. And a hyperthyroid. Remember in bradycardia, we had a hypothyroid, low and slow. And now we've got an increased metabolism. So it really becomes important to identify the underlying cause in order to grab the right treatment. Let's go back one slide. My slides are just out of order. Here's a sinus tachycardia. So you can see that we have the characteristic P wave, QRS, and a T wave, but then they come so quickly, QRS, T wave. Now our ST segment is not flat so much, and that's because it's happening so fast, it just moves right into the T wave. This is pretty common in a sinus tachy, that the ST segment will not be on the isoelectric line. It's almost like the slurring of the J point. We have a slurring into the T wave, because they're just happening so darn fast. Now, when we compare the normal sinus rhythm strip on the top with the sinus tachy on the bottom, you can immediately pick out that there are more QRS complexes in the bottom strip. With a six second strip, you would count all of these. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and we're gonna multiply 11 by 10. So we have a heart rate of 110 happening right now. Whereas opposed to the normal sinus rhythm, one, two, three, four, five, six, we have a heart rate of 60. That is the characteristic feature of a sinus tachycardia is that you will see all of the waveforms, the intervals, and they will be faster than 100 beats per minute. Now in, I didn't mention this in sinus bradi, but it would happen with sinus bradi as well and sinus tachy. Remember the QT interval, in this case, my QT interval is gonna be really short and I need to correct it. So don't forget to do your corrected value. But we still need to do our eight steps because who knows, this might be an SVT, this could be an AFib, this could be an atrial flutter that we're just not able to see. So we need to do our measurements. What this will look like is the key features is a normal P wave, round and upright. Remember, a round and upright P wave is the SA node in charge. When the P wave starts to change shape, that means there's somebody else in the kitchen. There will be one for every QRS waveform. And then they're just fast. 
greater than 100. There's just more of them. So in terms of looking at our elements for our assessment, our rhythm for both atrial and ventricular will be regular. The rate for both atrial and ventricular will be greater than 100. But our PR interval will be normal. Our QRS complex will be normal. And our QT interval may actually be shorter than 0.36 seconds or it will be within normal range. If it is outside of normal, you need to do a QT corrected. And the ST segment will be flat if it's visible. So again, symptomatic or asymptomatic, we always need to ask those two questions. Is my ECG normal or abnormal? And if it's abnormal, are they symptomatic or asymptomatic? In this case, we're looking for maybe complaints of chest pain, palpitations, and again, all those things we've talked about before with decreased cardiac output. Their changes in LOC, they're confused, they're not able to answer correctly, failing faint, uh, their heart rate is elevated, their heart respiratory rate is elevated, they're cold and clammy. If they're symptomatic, they need to be treated. If they're asymptomatic, we'll start there. If they're asymptomatic, what can we do to help them to decrease that heart rate? Because we don't want an elevated heart rate, a sustained Increased heart rate is not good for the body. The heart will tire out eventually. So for asymptomatic, again, what's their history? Were they exercising? Well, maybe it's time to stop exercising if you're starting to feel huffy and puffy. Were they drinking 12 cups of coffee in the morning? Maybe we need to look at reducing the volume. Do they have a lot of stress and anxiety, fears and worries? Perhaps we need to put in some counseling or listening and identifying what those issues are in the workplace. So, what is it that's causing the heart rate to elevate? And then how can we treat it? On your page here, I have here to use antipyretics for a fever, antibiotics for an infection, and drink more water if you're low in fluids, dehydration. Now sinus tachycardia is considered to be a physiological response to external conditions, fear, anxiety, fever, decreased levels of fluid in the cardiovascular system. And this, re this results in the heart rate elevating in order to compensate. If they become symptomatic, typically the heart rate is greater than 150 when symptoms of decreased LOC start to show up. And that's what we call supraventricular tachycardia. And we will be talking about that in another section in this course. So for symptomatic patients whose heart rate is between 100 and 150, we are still looking at finding those underlying conditions so that we can treat them. And then if it's not resolving, then we'll have to get a consultation to make sure that we haven't missed anything. In the next section, we're gonna move into sinus blocks.